There's a song that I heard long time back. The music of the song, I do not know. And the author of this song, also unknown to me. But the song has some beautiful message. And I want to just give you a little glimpse of what this song speaks about. It talks about a pastor busy to save the world, invites his members to deny self, live humbly, give their tithes as per the letter of the law. But then, the author of the song says, all that is done just as a requirement. But where is the love? Then it talks about an executive sitting on the 32nd floor on Wall Street, making decisions, exchanging commodities, and willing to offer aid and help wherever there is a famine or a distress. And then the author says, all this is done not because there is love, but simply because there is power that is in the hands of the strong. Then he goes on to say that he saw a neighbor who was taken to a home, a home for the weak and discarded because he had no other place to go. And then he says, the man there satisfied with the food that is given to him, the clothing that is given to him, but misses the freedom. And then he says, is this all there is? When your usefulness is gone, something is wrong. Something is wrong in heaven tonight. You can almost hear them cry. Angels to the left and the right saying, what about the love? What about the love? And then he concludes with this stanza he says, I looked into the mirror, proud as I could be, and I saw my pointing finger pointing back at me, saying, who named you accuser? Who gave you the scales? I hung my head in sorrow. I could almost feel the nails to be crucified and judged without love. To be crucified and judged without love. This evening, we'll spend a few minutes studying about this very important aspect of our existence, love. God speaking about, Jesus speaking about the Decalogue that we have. He said, all the commandments can be summed up into just two. One, love your God with all your heart, your mind and soul. And then, love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. Yes, that is the whole scriptures summed up. Love God, love your fellow man. But then, my friends, we realize that we are living in a loveless society today. Lack of love in families, causing shattered lives and broken homes. Lack of love in our societies is resulting 
in uncontrollable crimes and chaotic conditions. Lack of love in the world is causing restless and trustless nations. Lack of trust among the loved ones is causing untold misery and ruined lives. The whole universe is indeed a loveless one. If there was that love to the minutest possible, there would be no strife, no sorrow, no problems. If there was love, there would have been trust, there would have been peace, there would have been joy and happiness. But then, why there is no love? It's not in the world. It is too large, perhaps, for us to talk about the world. We don't have love in our community. We don't have love in our churches. We don't have love in our families. And that is the sad situation. Yes, to love someone may sound easy. But to love that person as you should love as yourself is difficult. Worse still, to love someone who has wronged you, deceived you, hurt you, blamed you, doubted you, angered you, and broken your heart is indeed very hard. Paul says in Galatians chapter 5, verse 14, you have your Bibles? Please turn with me to Galatians chapter 5, 14. Here it says, For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love your neighbor as yourself. James, in second chapter, verse 8, he says, If ye fulfill the royal law, according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well. Our Lord expressed in his own words, in Matthew 19, 19, he said, Thou shalt love, love thy neighbor as thyself. And in 22nd chapter, verse 39, he said, And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. But if you look at Matthew 5, 43, he gives a, a slightly different meaning to this, Love your neighbor as yourself. Please look at Matthew 5, 43. Here it says, Matthew 5, 43. Here it says, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, listen carefully, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Note the emphasis our Lord puts on the second part along with the reverence he is due from each one of us. In Mark 12, 31, he says, and the second is like, namely this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. Love thy neighbor as thyself. As for the first four commandments in the Decalogue, we have heard many a sermon on many an occasion. Sermons such as, be reverent and pay homage due to God Almighty. We have been repeatedly admonished that we should not take the name of the Lord God in vain, that we should keep the Sabbath holy and that we should honor him and respect him by not taking any other gods before him. But then, a very important 
theme is also discussed along with these. And that is, we should mend our ways. We are lukewarm. We have to do something. We should be either hot or cold and not be left in between. We are not often told where we are going wrong. What is our mistake and where we have been failing? These days, many sermons are preached from the pulpit not to hurt people's feelings. Not to hurt people's feelings. But then, to be told what is wrong, to be told where we are going astray is very important for our Christian experience. And so, this evening, as we spend a few minutes contemplating on this topic, I hope this study will not be an offense to anybody, but be an eye-opener to all of us. A story is told of Arthur Bressy and Skinner. Two very good friends grew up from high school days, went to college, and then joined the army together. They even rode the troop ship that took them to the Philippines during the Second World War. While they were there, Skinner's battalion was captured by Japanese army in 1942. And Arthur was captured a month later. Arthur learned that Skinner was near death in a concentration camp. And one day as Arthur's company was passing by, he requested the captain for five minutes to find out his friend and inquire of his condition. The time was given. He went and found out that there was Skinner in Zero Ward. Now, Zero Ward was the ward where dying people were kept. And there was a second ward for the people who may recover. So, Arthur found Skinner in the Zero Ward. Skinner was there suffering with malaria, amoebic dysentery, pellagra, scurvy, and beriberi. Skinner's body was a dormitory for tropical disease. He couldn't eat, couldn't drink. He was nearly gone. And Arthur, looking at him, did not know what to say and what to do. His five minutes were almost over. And he suddenly felt the handkerchief that he had around his neck. And pulling the handkerchief, the ring that he was hiding from the soldiers, he took out. A ring that he was not supposed to carry with him. At the possibility of punishment, he carried this ring secretly to sometime barter this for a little food, maybe for medicines that he may need in the enemy hands. Now looking at this ring, he looked at Skinner and he gave that ring to Skinner and said, Skinner, wheel and deal as you find it best. And with these words, he left not knowing he would ever see Skinner again. What kind of love you think that was? Can it be earned as some of us earn titles to ourselves? It is one thing to give a gift to the healthy and share our treasure with the strong. But to give your best to the weak and to entrust your treasure to the dying, that is saying something. It is saying to him, I believe in you, I love you. I believe in you, I love you. You want to know definitely what happened to Skinner. 
Skinner took the ring and gave it to the kindest God he had in that world. And then requested him to give him tablets, lemon for his curvy, and a pair of pants and a shirt in exchange for the ring. Soon Skinner got well and he was the first American soldier to leave the zero war and go to the other side. Yes, all this happened to Skinner because someone was there to believe in him enough, trust him enough and love him enough. Some of you may be thinking, perhaps you could have been in Arthur and Skinner's place and hopefully your situation is as easy as it had been with both of them. But remember, Skinner was a dying man, but a good man, a good friend. And so if Arthur did what he did, Perhaps you may say, because he was a good man, a good friend, he deserved all that, that happened to him. But then, how do you believe in someone who isn't good? How do you believe in a man who cheats on you or an employee who swindles you? Does love ignore all things? I don't think so. This passage is not a call for blindness. It is, however, a call for us to give to others what God has given to each one of us. Turn with me to book of Romans, to chapter 13, and we shall look at verses 8 to 10. Romans 13, 8 to 10. Here it says, O oh, no man, anything but to love one another. For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. For this, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet, and if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love worketh, Verse 10, no evil to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. If there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love worketh no evil, no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is fulfilling of the law. Turn with me to Leviticus chapter 19 and we shall see here what other admonition we receive in verse 18. Chapter 19 verse 18. Thou shalt not avenge, it says here, nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people. But thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord. Yes, my friends, revenge, retaliation, punish, even the scores, vengeance, retribution, reprisal, bitterness, animosity, anger, hostility, all these are synonyms for avenge and grudge. Now the Bible says, you shall not that means you should never avenge, bear any grudge against your neighbor. The Old Testament, of course, a different approach earlier, especially the Mosaic law. It said, if somebody cut your hand away, his hand should be cut. Eye for eye and tooth for tooth. Mahatma Gandhi, speaking about this principle, he said, an eye for an eye makes the whole world blind. Is that true? If we followed that Old Testament principle of eye for eye, 
according to Mahatma Gandhi, the whole world will turn blind. Holding anger within oneself towards another person results in having a grudge towards that person. Sherry Carter Scott made this statement. She said, anger makes you smaller. Anger makes you smaller, while forgiveness forces you to grow beyond what you were. Don't you want to grow? Growth is a sign of life. And so, holding anger, you're only remaining smaller. But if you want to grow tall, follow what we are admonished to follow. To follow. John Lauden in Healthy Living magazine said, holding on to anger, resentment and hurt only gives you tense muscles, a headache and a sore jaw from clenching your teeth. Forgiveness gives you back the laughter and the lightness in your life. And then Josh Billings made this very striking statement. He said, there is no revenge, please listen, there is no revenge so complete as forgiveness. There is no revenge so complete as forgiveness. Yes, the Bible also says, if anyone dislikes his neighbor intensely sins. Proverbs 14, 21. He that despiseth his neighbor sinneth, but he that hath mercy on the poor, happy is he. God has given us many talents, but the talent to like our neighbor is an important one. To like somebody may not look pleasant, may not look beautiful or handsome, may not look attractive, but still deserves to be loved. Yes, this talent of liking is not like the talent of singing. Those of us who have the talent of singing, you know, it is something that we are all proud of. But then all of us are not blessed with this talent of singing. Those of us who cannot sing, we can still love people. We can still like our neighbor. And so, why don't we love our neighbors as ourselves? Why don't we have that likeness for our neighbors? Why don't we like our neighbors? Something to consider and something to contemplate. God has given us this talent of life, liking our neighbors. And we should see, use it well. Or else, one day the Lord is going to say, why have you dealt so and so with your neighbor instead of doing it the way I wanted you to do? Just like that man with one talent who buried it was questioned. Yes, he that despiseth his neighbor sinneth. These are pretty strong words and should not be taken lightly. In Galatians 6 chapter verse 10, Paul says, we have the opportunity to help anyone, we should do it. There's a story of two people confronting each other in an auction hall. There's auction going on to raise funds in a school and somebody gave a purebred puppy to be auctioned. And so, looking at that puppy, many people pulled out their checkbooks and these two were, in particular, a man and a woman who sat on opposite sides. And as the bidding went, it went into thousands of dollars now and most others' bidding dropped, leaving these two challenging each other. Finally, the story tells us that the man dropped and the woman won that puppy. And when the puppy was present to that woman, she looked at that puppy and suddenly felt embarrassed for what she did all that while 
trying to compete with that man and raising the bid. So you know what she did? She took that puppy, walked over to the other side, and put that puppy in the hands of that man who was her competitor till now. Yes, what do you think must have happened? What do you think must have happened? The man receiving that puppy. Well, sure the man was, man was happy. And sure, the woman felt happy for what she did. My friend, suppose you did this with your competition or with your enemy or with the boss who fired you or your wife who left you. Suppose you surprise them with kindness. It's not easy. It's not easy at all. But mercy is deepest gesture of kindness. Shakespeare in Merchant of Venice made this statement. He said, mercy is double, doubly blessed. It blesses the one who shows and the one who receives it. Paul equates these two. He says, be kind one to another. Tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Ephesians 4.32. In 1 Corinthians 13 chapter, that love chapter, we have a whole list of what love is to be. What love does for us, what we should do if we have that love for others, especially verses 4 to 7. You have the power to change someone's life by simply using right words. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, says wise men in Proverbs 18.21. You will either break somebody's life or make it. That's why Paul urges you and me to be careful. When you talk, do not say harmful things, but say what people need. Words that will help others become stronger. The words that we so carelessly use may, may, kill a person's spirit. So what we use, what we say, what we talk, what we do, all must be motivated by that love, the love that comes to us from God above. Nathal Hathrow came home one day heartbroken. He had just been fired from the custom house and as he sat there with a long face, his wife, rather than responding with anxiety, surprised him with joy. She said, now, Nathaniel, you can write that book. And what shall we live on while I'm writing that book? He said, not positive. To his amazement, she opened a drawer, pulled a word of notes that she saved from her housekeeping budget. I always knew that you were a man of genius, she said. I always knew you'd write a masterpiece. She believed in her husband, and because she did, he wrote. And because he wrote, every library in this country has a copy of this book, The Scarlet Letters, by Nathaniel Hawthorne. Someone has said it. This, today's thoughts are tomorrow's actions. Today's jealousy is tomorrow's temper tantrum. Today's bigotry is tomorrow's hate crime. Today's anger is tomorrow's abuse. Today's greed is tomorrow's hate embezzlement. And today's guilt is tomorrow's fear. Today's thoughts are tomorrow's actions. Yes, Apostle, Paul, uh, Apostle John, he talks about God's providence for each one of us in terms of doing his bidding in our lives. He puts it in the sequence, he says, God made a deposit for each one of us and all that we have to do is pull our checks and 
draw from the deposit that God made. You read this in 1 John 4 chapter, verses 9 and 10. Here it says, God showed how much he loved us by sending his only son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. This is real love. It is not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. And because God did that, John says, having made such an outrageous eye-opening deposit, we need to pull our checkbooks. Since God loved us that much, we surely ought to love each other. Since God loved us that much, we ought to love each other just like that. A three-year-old hit her head on a space heater and blacked out. So the parents rushed her to the hospital and after the needful job done in the hospital, she was kept there for observation and treatment for a few days and then sent home. One morning, her parents woke up early to hear her say in her crib, bear, sheep, doggy, baby, etc. So the parents listened to all this listing that she was making. And then, of course, they said to themselves, why not? Poor child, she had a terrible accident. Her skull was broken, fractured. And now she's taking a stock of all her friends, making sure that they're all there. After a little while, they heard her say, hair, eye, hand, etc. And they said, what's happening? Well, whatever was happening. She, after making a note of all her friends that they were safe in her crib with her, she now started taking a roll of herself, her eyes, her hand, her hair, etc. If we follow this little girl's lead and take a stock of our friends, our neighbors, how wonderful it would be. Yes, we need to take a stock of relationships. Think about the people that we have in this world who populate your circle of the world. Aren't they valuable? Aren't they essential? Aren't those relationships worth whatever it takes to keep them healthy? To say, I want you, I love you. Yes, granted, people can be difficult. But still, what's more important than people? Think of it this way. Suppose you are at your life's end. Suppose you are dying and uh, you have no time to leave. What would you look for? Would you look for your college degree and hug it? Or would you ask your people to carry you into the garage so you can sit in your car? The last few moments you would want to be with your loved ones, with your dear ones, with those who matter a lot. And so, my friends, people matter a lot in our lives. What can we do to strengthen this experience? Following these little girls' lead, we should take an inventory of our hearts and see where we are. Take an inventory. Am I living in the overflow of God's love? How well do I love the people in my life? Does the way I treat people reflect the way God has treated me? Yes, we need to take an inventory of ourselves. When we are vengeful, hold grudges, despise our neighbors, not helpful and not kind, we'll remember his kindness. His patience, he's being there to help us and ask him to make us more like him. When it's hard to forgive, we won't list all the times 
we have been given grief. Rather, we will list all the times we have been given grace and pray to become more forgiving. Somebody wrote these few words. The title is Through Me. Through me, let there be kind words, a warm smile, and a caring heart. Through me, let there be a willingness to listen and readiness to understand. Through me, let there be dependability, steadfastness, trust, and loyalty. Through me, let there be compassion, forgiveness, mercy, and love. Through me, let there be every quality I find, O Lord, in Thee. Yes, that song that I started out with ends with the chorus. And the chorus is, Something is wrong in heaven tonight. You can almost hear them cry. Angels to the left and to the right. Saying, what about the love? What about the love? What about the love of God? If that love of God is in you and me, that same love would be reflected in our experiences, in our relationships with our neighbors and in turn, we can bring that happiness in heaven and the happiness on the face of the angels as we live, as God wants us to live, the Christian life on this earth.